I'd like to welcome uh, to London to the Sport and Leisure History Seminar, uh, Connor Heffernan, who is going to talk to us about sports in Zaire under uh, Mobutu during the 60s and 70s. Connor is a first year PhD student at University College Dublin, but he's already published two articles, uh, one on this subject, Sport in Zaire, and another article on Indian clubs for sport and society. And uh, really looking forward to the paper, so take it away. Okay, thanks. So, my name is Connor Heffernan, and it's a pleasure to be here this evening to talk about my passion project, my pet project, which is Zaire in history, or more fittingly, Zaire in sporting history. My PhD research is concerned with the rise of physical culture, of bodybuilding movements in early 20th century Ireland. Zaire in sporting history was, is, and continues to be for me something that I turn to whenever I need of a good distraction an occurrence which happens far too regularly for my own supervisor's liking. <laughs> Nevertheless, tonight I'm going to step out of my comfort zone and recount a story of sport and society, of colonialism and post-colonialism, of race and identity, and a reminder about what we choose to see in authoritarian regimes. Now this story encapsulates the beautiful game, the man who floated like a butterfly yet stone like a bee, and a leader whose excesses have gone down in history. Tonight we're going to look at Zaire from its independence in 1960, to the height of its international sporting fame in the mid-1970s. But before going into that, I do need to address the question of how an Irish man with an interest in the body got so captivated by the Congo, without the help of Henry Morton Stanley, that is. So it's 1998 and the FIFA World Cup is underway. My beloved Republic of Ireland are sadly absent from the tournament yet again, meaning that I'm largely forced to rely upon English coverage of the games. A blow is softened by the fact that comedians Frank Skinner and David Baddiel are providing some stellar comedic relief in their fancy World Cup live show. One day, however, they included a segment on something that my formative mind hadn't yet seen, this being a London Mwaku supposed gaff at the 1974 World Cup when he kicked the ball away during an opposition free kick. This incident, as I soon learned, was one of great hilarity, as the following clip hopefully suggests. So, we'll see how we get on. I'm going to turn that down so we don't get kicked out of the library. Those are from YouTube clips. <laughs> so, Ilunga, in the 1974 World Cup, you played for Zaire. What would you say was the funniest moment ever in the history of the World Cup? So, what the hell was that about? That was the question in my young mind at the time. But sadly, my interest in learning more was quickly curtailed. In a pre-broadband era, the scant footballing sources which recounted this story were, at best, condescending, and at worst, deeply racist. For many, the BBC's iconic commentator John Motson had settled the issue when he described it as a bizarre moment of African ignorance. And it wasn't until many years later that I chanced upon a collection of Zion documents in an archive which began to tell a different story, which, I promise, we will return to. But in a moment of historical serendipity, one of the four first sources I came across contained this rather amazing quotation. In Zaire, we do not consider sport as a mere amusement, but as a socio-cultural, political phenomenon. Now, what kind of historian would leave after that quote, eh? I was hooked, plain and simple, so I began to dig a little deeper, and things began to unravel to the point that I now have the hubris necessary to speak on this subject tonight. Speaking of which, I should probably get on with things. 
So this evening, I'm going to play sport within a larger political context and examine how it is utilised in state identity formation. In doing so, I'm going to suggest, nay argue, that Zayn dictator Joseph Mobutu utilised sport at a critical juncture in the country's history and used it to help foster a national identity, both internally and externally. Now this, I suspect, is something of a lofty goal, so to get us to this point, we're going to begin with a brief examination of the Congo pre-Mobutu, and then the challenges facing the would-be dictator upon his rise to power in 1965. Following this, Mobutu and his political party, the NPR, initial forays into using sport as a political tool are uh, studied, with reference to the period 1965 to 1970, before we look at the bolder actions taken in the post-1970 period. Having looked at internal identity formation, we'll then examine external identity formation, with reference to the 1974 heavyweight bout between Muhammad Ali and George Foreman, the Rumble in the Jungle, held in Zaire in October 1974, and the experiences of the Zaire football team at the 1974 FIFA World Cup. So, in the first instance, don't worry. In discussing the background to Mobutu's reign, I have no intention of ham-fistedly using quotations from Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, nor will I begin with Stanley's Expeditions of the Congo or Belgium's rather checkered administration of the region. Instead, I think it decidedly more beneficial, less cliched and less time-consuming to briefly look at the country's disjointed decolonisation process at the beginning of the 1960s. Just months after the British Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan, famously noted the winds of change sweeping across colonial Africa, the Belgian Congo, or Congo Free State as it was then known, had achieved independence, being among some of the first African states to do so. Headed by a coalition government of Patrice Lumumba as the Prime Minister and Joseph Kasavubu as the President, the newly emerging state got off to perhaps the funniest and indeed rockiest of starts. At the official handing over ceremony of the Congo, Belgian King Baden's assertions that the Belgian state had brought civilization, modernity and peace to the rabid African nation were quickly rebuked by Patrice Lumumba in a ferocious tirade against the system of colonialism that Belgium had inflicted on the state. Now, although Baldwin and Lumumba made up, they did after all finish their state dinner, the country's political situation quickly descended into chaos. Within months, the army had mutinied, two states had attempted to secede from the country, and a hodgepodge of British, American, Belgian, Chinese and Soviet forces had intervened within the country. The Congo crisis, as it became known in later years, lasted for half a decade and was only ended in 1965 when Joseph Mobutu, pardon me, an army general backed by Belgium and the US brought a tentative peace to the country. And far from the optimistic future facing Lumumba in 1960, the country facing Mobutu in 1965 was an altogether different prospect. Indeed, although promised foreign assistance from his Western allies, Mobutu's new state still had two significant and seemingly insurmountable problems. And the first was the sheer diversity of the region. In 1965, government reports estimated that nearly 400 ethnic groups existed within the Congo with nearly as many dialects. And while the accuracy of any government reporting during this time is certainly wrought with problems, and indeed any government reporting during Mobutu's reign is wrought with problems, the fact that such a figure even seemed plausible to suggest gives pause for thought. After all, two states, South Kasai and Katanga, had attempted to secede from the state. Internal unity was thus a real concern. Now, coupled with this, on the international stage, Congo's reputation was beleaguered at best. The Congo crisis and intervention of both Western and Soviet powers contributed to the image of a country being manipulated both by capitalists and communists, an image of a country that was still colonised in all but name, and an image of a country where untold atrocities had, were, and would continue to occur. Indeed, surveying the Western newspaper reports from this time reveals a sheer lack of originality from English and American reporters many of whom commit that sin of quoting Conrad's Heart of Darkness as gospel. Now, perhaps the most damaging images from the Congo crisis came in 1961, when former Prime Minister by that stage, Patrice Lumumba, was shown worldwide being manhandled by opposition troops just weeks before his execution. And quite remarkably, this footage still exists on YouTube, was in several documentaries on Mobutu's reign, and it's quite distressing at the time, and still is, to see Lumumba, this figure of optimism in a new Africa being manhandled just weeks before his execution. Now, closer to my own home, the fight between Irish and Baluba soldiers in 1960 led to the term Baluba being adopted in Ireland to describe a wilder, uncontrollable person. Nowadays, it's a term of affection to describe the town drunk, 
but I just wanted to shove that Irish neologism in by hook or by crook. So, what was Mobutu's key aim following his power seizure in 1965? He and his followers had brought a tentative, indeed a very tentative peace to the state. Now what would they do with it? This is the question that the US, UN and USSR all wanted to know. Well, perhaps unsurprisingly, great efforts were placed into consolidating and expanding Mobutu's burgeoning political power. This was bread and butter stuff of power consolidation and staying alive, for want of a better word. Mobutu, more than anyone else, knew just how closely the sword of Damocles swung over leaders' heads within the Congo. He thus wanted and needed security. But, and this is where we jump in tonight, he also wanted and strove to gain a greater global recognition of Congolese sovereignty. He wanted and strove to create a united Congolese identity, and importantly, it seems, at times, he wanted and strove to aggrandize himself within this process. So with these lofty and certainly egoistic goals in mind, we'll now examine the tentative steps taken by Mobutu from 1965 to 1970 to create an internal Congolese identity through football. So why football, I sense some of you wonder? Why the beautiful game? And while this answer may seem obvious at times given the purchase that sport, and football in particular, has amongst populations, there are several things to highlight here. First, although played for several decades within the Congo, Congo was by no means a footballing powerhouse at this time. Indeed, in the African footballing hierarchy, Congo could at best be described as a low to middling run. In Africa at that time, the strongest teams tended to reside in the north, and certainly not in the sub-Saharan region. Secondly, African football in general was being stymied by a conservative and Western-dominated footballing structure. I am of course referring to FIFA, the now much maligned footballing organisation that seems to get more comical each coming month, let alone year. Well, when Mobutu came to power in 1965, FIFA was under great pressure from Asian and African teams to grant more World Cup allocation places to these continents. For example, at the 1966 World Cup, held here in England, only one allocation place was given for Asian, African and Oceanic teams, and I don't think anyone here would fancy those odds. Neither did the Asian or African teams, who boycotted the 1966 World Cup en masse. A strong message to FIFA, which oddly led to North Korea's first World Cup appearance. Thankfully, the boycott forced FIFA's hand, and from the 1970 World Cup onward, it was decided that at least one allocation place would be given to an Asian team, and at least one allocation place would be given to an African team and Mobutu's Congo quickly benefited from this change. Finally, football seemed an odd choice for Mobutu in pursuing his political aims, as its origins were inherently colonial. Belgium had brought the game to the Congo, and had introduced it largely through the army. Yet Mobutu, himself a former army goalkeeper, was keenly aware of football's unifying power. In 1966, he organised a friendly with Kame and Kuruma's Ghana to mark the birth of a new Congolese nation. Now, Nkrumah himself was a case study in using football for political means. Instrumental in the 1966 World Cup boycott, Nkrumah's political meddling effectively financed Ghana's victories at the 1963 and 1965 African Cup of Nations. Thus, it could be nev never be said that Mobutu didn't learn from the best. Now, off the field, Mobutu's influence over the beautiful game quickly became even more apparent. Symbolically, in 1966, following the renaming of three major colonial cities, Mobutu changed the Congolese football team name from the Lions to the Leopards. Additionally, football teams and football stadiums were renamed to reflect more traditional African values. And while a rose by any other name smells of course just as sweet, Jackson and Roseburg have depicted this period as a time when Mobutu attempted to truly decolonize the Congo and establish a separate and identifiable African identity. Now for me, the renaming of Congolese stadia, clubs and cities really neatly fits such a thesis. What's more, Mobutu and his political party, the NPR, put their money, or perhaps more fittingly, the country's money, where their mouth was. In 1966, Mobutu stated, Sport is just as important as the economy, a quote which leaves any sporting historian simply salivating at the prospects of studying it. And indeed, Mobutu and his party treated soccer as an investment. For example, they had no qualms about providing large sums of money for the repatriation of Congolese players, applying their trade in Belgium. Such players had established themselves in the Belgian League from the late 1950s, and it was highly symbolic to have such players, known at the time as Belge Africain, return to the Congo. Now, of course, Eric Hobsbawm once argued that the imagined community of millions 
seem more real as a team of 11 named players. Ruminate then on this transaction. Mobutu and his new political party were bringing back the Belge African players. They were taking from the coloniser and bringing back to the formerly colonised. The jingoism practically wrote itself. And from the Congolese Football Association documents held in Zurich, we know that Mobutu was really the driving force behind this repatriation, the cost of which is quite high. Internally, Mobutu's constant meddling led to quite comical resentment from the Congolese FA about the new leader's overstepping of his boundaries. Externally, the cost was just simply financial. In 1967, the Congolese FA paid over 950,000 Belgian francs for the return of four of these Belge African players to the Congo. But this did not discourage more investment in football. If anything, it spurred on even more. The following year, 1968, Samo Butu and his party invest heavily into improving training facilities around the Congo, but especially in the capital of Kinshasa. And this would be important in later years, as the 1974 World Cup team was largely made up of players from Kinshasa. Just one reminder of the importance of the allocation of sporting funds. Now, remarkably, Mobutu also spent a lot of time bringing over star football teams to play against the Leopards and hence improve their standards. Quite remarkably, this also included Pele Santos, who were touring across Africa during the late 1960s. And very soon, it became clear that Mobutu and his party were onto something. Indeed, his investments, for want of a better word, were beginning to pay dividends. In 1968, Congo won the African Cup of Nations, and instantly, Mobutu utilised this victory. Upon returning home, each player emerged from the airplane wearing the leopard skin cap synonymous with Mobutu. The national newspaper, Salongo, published photos of Mobutu meeting and greeting the players, and Mobutu even presented medals to the victorious team for all to see. The message was thus clear. Mobutu had supported this side, and what they did was not only representative of themselves and the country, but also of the great leader, of Mobutu himself. And in a captivating documentary from 2008, entitled Entre le Coup et l'Election, Foba and Mouya presented really interesting videographic evidence of the strong ties being created between Mobutu and the Leopards during this time. And just one example of this was to be found in the money being carried around in people's pockets. From 1970, Congolese banknotes displayed a picture of Mobutu side by side with Kinshasa Stadium, the national stadium. Mobutu thus left no doubts about who was behind the Leopard's success, and I think very obviously displayed who was funding it. And things just seemed to get better and better. Encouraged both by Mobutu's investment and victory at the 1968 African Cup of Nations, Congolese teams were beginning to become something of a football powerhouse. In both 1969 and 1970, Congolese teams emerged victorious in the African Champions Cup. An incredible feat for a nation that was ravaged by a civil and arguably international war earlier in that very decade. Now, how then did such success affect Congolese identity formation? Were Mobutu's efforts off or not, or were they bolstering his regime and even a sense of unity within the country? And while such questions are of course never fully answerable, the evidence points to a positive and at times powerful reaction from Mobutu's subjects. In 1968, the highly regarded Egyptian footballing journalist Majoub wrote of the great nationalist fervour exuded from the Congolese fans, players and coaching staff in the build-up, duration and aftermath of matches, a nationalist fervour unthinkable just a few years previous. And indeed, it appears that a strong relationship between football and the United Nationhood did emerge in the Congo in the late 1960s. For example, we have several Western travel accounts of the Congo from this period, all of which are unanimous in praising Mobutu for helping to dissipate or at least quell the regional tensions within the state. Furthermore, some accounts specifically cite his mastery of sporting politics as one such reason. Football, I believe then, contributed in creating an internal Congolese identity that was separate from its colonial past, facilitated unity, and importantly for Mobutu, help present him in a positive light to a sceptical, and many would say rightly sceptical, domestic polity. But there's more. You see, as Congo's economic and political situation improved, and by that I mean domestic growth and a relative calm, Mobutu and his political party, the NPR, used sport much, much more dynamically. You see, it's during this period, in the early 1970s, that Mobutu attempted to establish a Congolese internal identity largely centred on Mobutu and a sense of universal Africanism. This was famously exhibited in 1971 
the Mobutu pushed through a policy of authenticité within the Congo. Now far from a meaningless piece of propaganda, authenticité meant business. Mobutu changed the country's name from Congo to Zaire. Zaireans were encouraged to Africanize their names, wear traditional clothing, and address one another as citizen. Barker has depicted this period as a time when Mobutu attempted to enact his own cultural revolution, aimed at promoting a traditional, African, and inherently pre-colonial identity. And what's more, it's important to mention that authenticité was not confined to one remit of Zaireen society. It was a multifaceted movement that in time affected Zaireen football. Echoing, I suppose, the repatriation process of the 1960s, the 1970s would see footballers redefined as national, national treasures, national treasures that Mobutu was keen to hold on to. As authenticité's remit grew, the opportunity to play for foreign football teams abroad became unthinkable and indeed impossible for Zaire footballers. Supposedly, Mobutu himself even informed the players that Zaire must not become the cradle in Africa for Europe's mercenaries. Stadiums were renamed once more, with three of the stadiums named after the great leader himself, the great leader whose humility and grace was slowly but surely beginning to wane. Investment was still directed towards football, and the national media outlet Salongo made clear to all and sundry that Mobutu was the driving force behind all of this. And remarkably, Mobutu and his party grew even bolder in their economic, political and sporting policies following a process of Zairianization in 1973. And unlike authenticité, which was largely focused on internal identity and a growing citizenry, Zairianization had a very definitive impact on others, most notably the foreign companies operating within, the, within Zaire, which were promptly nationalised. Zairianization was coupled with the Mobutuism, a personality cult of Mobutu, that quickly became quite farcical in its public adoration. One such instance of this was a former Prime Minister of Mobutu's regime, who claimed in all seriousness at one point that nothing is possible in Zaire without Mobutu. Funnily, in Ireland we say that nothing is possible without our political leaders, but that's an altogether different presentation for a different day. And the attempt to create an internal Zaire identity, centred around Mobutu as a stately and wise figurehead, were in turn facilitated by sport. And it's during this period in the early 1970s, when Zaire economic growth is reportedly hovering around 7% a year, that Mobutu began a public policy of patronage towards athletes, similar to the patronage found in other aspects of Zaire life. For example, following the Leopards' qualification for the 1974 World Cup and their victory in that year's African Cup of Nations, Solongo declared that Mobutu had given each player a car, a house and two weeks' vacation. And such patronage was emblematic of the wider sultanistic system that Mobutu had installed in the country as a means of keeping the peace and enhancing the lives of his followers. But it should be said that nothing comes of nothing, and such patronage had a price for the citizenry. Prior to the departure for the World Cup, a soccer tax of 10 Zaires was collected from each citizen to supposedly fund the Leopards on their oncoming success. And such patronage wasn't confined to the beautiful game. For the heavyweight bout between Muhammad Ali and George Foreman, scheduled in October 1974 in Zaire, Mobutu announced that each athlete would be given $5 million regardless of the result. Similar to his masterful use of the beautiful game, Mobutu used a fistic science to present himself as a patron to his people. In 1974, huge billboards hung outside Kinshasa Stadium, proclaiming that the Ali Foreman fight was a gift from the president to the Zaire people. Nevertheless, Mobutu's patronage was only one side of the power keeping coin, the other being sheer blunt force. While well, Mobutu used sport to forge his iron identity around himself as a wise and stately figurehead, he also used it to demonstrate his enormous political power. Following Zaire's disastrous World Cup campaign, in which they lost three matches, conceded 13 go- 14 goals pardon me, and scored none, Silongo ominously declared that Mobutu had personally summoned the players to meet with him in his compound, with later reports suggesting that they had been imprisoned for days as punishment. And indeed, even during the World Cup itself, there are reports in Western and African newspaper outlets of government interference with the Zaire team, with messages such as win or die allegedly being passed on to the manager and the players. Now, returning to Lunga Moepu's supposed free kick gas, we learned that prior to the Brazil match, Mobutu's henchmen had entered the players' quarters and told them that should they lose the game by more than four goals, they would not be allowed to return to the country. This is off the back of a 9-0 loss to Yugoslavia, and going into a game against the 1974 Brazilian World Cup team, one of the finest Brazilian teams at that time, was a scary prospect. 
With the team losing 3-0 and Brazil being awarded a free kick in a very dangerous area, Ilunga panicked, kicked the ball away and hoped to waste time. His tactics worked, the game ended 3-0, through, it seems, sheer fear from the Zarian players. And we see then that Mobutu engaged in great shows of strength through sport, and not all were as relatively peaceful, and I use that term very tenuously, as just mere threats. Prior to a domestic club match in 1974, Mobutu publicly tried and imparted death sentences to several criminals in front of 30,000 football fans in Kinshasa Stadium. And indeed, some newspaper reports suggest that Mobutu posed akin to a Roman emperor, letting the baying crowd decide should these men live or die, a verdict which he, the great leader, would then impart. Thus, it can be said that while the period 1965 to 1970 Saw Mobutu and his, youth par- and his party use sport to try and forge a united Zion identity. The early 1970s were marked by Mobutu's efforts to establish an internal Zion identity, largely focused on Mobutu himself. But externally, however, Mobutu's tactics for creating a Zion identity differed in that they were peaceful, conciliatory, and significantly raced. And it was here in the international realm that he attempted to create a Zion identity based on black power, Zion sovereignty, and Zion wealth. Now, of course, Mobutu being Mobutu, there were also efforts to aggrandize himself in this process, but that was thankfully a secondary concern for a large part of this. Now, regarding the beautiful game, regarding football, Mobutu presented himself as not only the founder of the Leopards, but also as the patron behind all of their success. Coupled with this, he also made great efforts to promote the sport abroad, again to aggrandize himself and prove Zion's wealth. On a trip to Cairo in 1972, Mobutu promised to donate large sums of money for the development of the Egyptian game, a gesture which earned him and the Leopards great kudos amongst the African teams. And remarkably, Zarian footballers also went to some lengths to promote the country's wealth abroad. In an interview with Shoot Magazine in 1974, Zaire's World Cup captain Kadumu joked that should Zaire win the World Cup, Mobutu might just give the players one of the proceeds from his rich copper mines. And such was the desire to foster an international identity of Zaire as a global nation that Mobutu and his party funded advertising hoardings at the 1974 World Cup to display messages such as Zaire, peace, and go to Zaire, as evidenced in the following steal from the Zaire Yugoslavia World Cup game, in which they lost 9 0. This, I think you'll agree, was a remarkable and, to my mind, unprecedented step. And while football was an important outlet, Boxing in 1974 was arguably much more important for fostering an international identity of Zaire. And this is certainly the case after the nation crashed out of the FIFA World Cup. The rumble in the jungle bout between Muhammad Ali and George Foreman gave Mobutu the opportunity to manipulate public opinion in a way that football simply couldn't. The gladiators noted the New York Times will serve as the most expensive PR man in the history of world government. Ali, reflecting on the fight in 75, noted it was a rich black man who paid me in form in a fight, and he did it because he wanted some publicity for his little country, and he got it. Now, Zaire really did need good publicity at this time. Aside from the aftermath of the Congo crisis, many mocked the country's name change from Congo to Zaire. Indeed, one writer for Ring magazine sarcastically summed up the question of millions when he asked, what, in heaven's name, is a Zaire? And in his quest to answer this question, Mobutu and his party spent $15 million refurbishing Kinshasa Stadium, building a new airport, and improving the infrastructure. One American TV executive noted, he converted a shithole into a first-class facility, a modern stadium that rivaled anything in a developed nation, and he did it in six months. And the heavyweight fight between Ali and Foreman gave Mobutu the opportunity to shape Zaire's international identity around ideas of black power and anti-colonialism. Huge billboards hid squatter shanties, proclaiming in French and English the regime's modernity. Other billboards linked Africans and African Americans against white supremacy. One sign proclaimed that black power is sought everywhere, but is already realised here in Zaire. Another, that a fight between two blacks in a black nation organised by blacks and seen by the entire world. That is a victory of Mobutuism. Interestingly, however, Mobutu is careful not to promote black power to the detriment of US Zaire relations and in this vein banned the production of one poster that proclaimed the fight told the story from slave ship to championship. And I think you can just practically imagine Don King coming up with that slogan yourself. Nevertheless, akin to the man who violently disposed Patrice Lumumba, Mobutu had no qualms about attacking systems of colonialism. 
One poster read, The country of Zaire, which has been bled because of pillage and systematic exploitation, must become a fortress against imperialism and a spearhead for the liberation of the African continent. Now, perhaps unsurprisingly, given all that we know about him, at the centre of many of these images was the face of Mobutu himself. Not only did Mobutu use the fight to present himself as a powerful and wealthy leader, but also as a trustworthy one. Posters for the fight proclaimed, Ali and Foreman have faith in Mobutu. So do like them, have faith in Mobutu. Now Mobutu was keenly aware of the publicity presented to him by this fight and ensured that luxury villas were provided to foreign journalists, that the streets around Kinshasa Stadium would be safe and that foreign visitors to the country would want for nothing. How successful then were Mobutu's efforts? This is, after all, the point of this long meandering talk. And in answering this, we have to distinguish between short and long-term results because initially, many of Mobutu's efforts were extremely successful. Prior to the bout, Time magazine noted, the real winner will be President Mobutu Sese Seko. The Balahu for the fight of the century has made the proud president's country an international household word, though a frequently mispronounced one. And with little need for encouragement, Muhammad Ali became a publicity machine for Zaire, both before, during and after the fight. When questioned in 1975 by US reporters, Ali used Zaire as an example through which to draw sharp criticisms of the US. In Zaire, everything was black, from the train drivers to the teachers in the schools. It was just like any other society, except that it was all black. And because I'm black-oriented and a Muslim, I was home there. I'm not home here in the US. Now, such was Mobutu's initial success, but US President Gerald Ford personally congratulated him on a decade of impressive accomplishment in 1975. Similarly, the political scientist Edelman noted that same year that Mobutu and the NPR's policy of authenticité and Zionization was beginning to be emulated in several other African states. And, of course, there was a lot to be said for the popular memory exacted by the fight, as evidenced by Johnny Wakelin's well-loved 1976 song, In Zaire. Feel free to dance, it's been a long day. <laughs> Stop now, but I kind of want to do sulfur, so. <laughs> Very good reason. Now, in the long term, however, it's arguable that Mobutu's efforts proved much less successful. Growing corruption and instability in Zaire from the mid 1970s, really until Mobutu's exile in 97, largely damaged in large part the redeeming qualities people chose to find in Mobutu's reign during the 1970s. Whereas in 1974, prior to the Ali Foreman bout, scholars and popular writers are much more likely to write positively of Zaire. Nowadays, people tend to view the fight as emblematic of the wider misappropriation of funds within the state. And indeed, the Ring magazine cover pardon me, of Ali and Foreman leaving the air with bundles of cash has undergone several interpretations. From once being a sign of a nation's seemingly endless prosperity, the cover is now seen as an example of a nation's feckless and misplanned spending. Now, growing instability, infighting and just plain disinterest, it seems, from Mobutu in sport, following Zaire's economic decline, led to a reversal of many of his previous successes. Such was the decline in patronage of the beautiful game that the Leopards were withdrawn from qualification from the 1978 World Cup. The reason, supposedly, was that the team wasn't patriotic enough. And similarly, Kinshasa Stadium... Oh, pardon me, I have skipped ahead. There we go. Never you mind. So, similarly, both in the duration of the World Cup games itself and also in the aftermath, 
Zaire's economic perform or pardon me, Zaire's sporting performance largely incurred the ire of Western and African writers. Zaire, after all, lost three matches, conceded 14 goals and scored none. This led to very serious concerns within the FIFA community about the quality of African teams. After all, this was only the second World Cup in which an African nation had qualified, or an African nation had been given an allocation place. Zaire was the first sub-Saharan African team to qualify for the Games, and its poor performance is seen as emblematic of the poor state of African football something which earned the state quite a lot of ire from both African and Western football nations. And the dire situation is much the same internally. Again, returning to Foba and Mouya's documentary, Entre le Coupe et l'Election, they had the opportunity to interview many of the players from the Zarian football team, many of whom talked about broken promises, unpaid bonuses, and a real lack of support from Zaire's uh, governing body once they returned from the World Cup. Now, following a sharp drop in copper prices in 1974 and economic mismanagement following a disastrous campaign of nationalisation in the 1970s, things went from bad to worse. As I mentioned, jumping ahead of myself, Mobutu withdrew with the team from the qualification from the 1978 World Cup. Similarly, Kinshasa Stadium, the home to the Ali Foreman fight, is currently rotting as we speak. No longer used for sporting entertainment, really no longer used from the 1980s onwards, the stadium has become a slum in the nation's capital a stark reminder of the excesses of Mobutu's early years. Now, Mobutu's efforts were, I would argue, futile in the long run. Indeed, from the mid-1970s, when the economy crashes, he's really on a downward slope, and the 1980s are plagued by famines, internal tensions, and gross economic and political mismanagement. Nevertheless, for one brief moment in 1974, it's arguable that the brutal dictator of there had succeeded in pulling the wall over not over his own citizens' eyes, but that of the international community. And in a bold strategy that combined the beautiful game and the sweet science, Mobutu's policy of aggrandizement and reckless spending briefly placed Zaire on the international stage in a manner few would have predicted. Sport was used to heal a nation's internal divisions and recreate its national identity. Sport was used to elevate a leader's following, and sport was used for a wider political purpose. Mobutu is not the first, nor will he be the last leader to do this. But his and his party efforts were so transparent, so outlandish, and indeed at times so successful, that I believe they warrant a special place in histories of politics, sport, and colonialism. Sporting history in Zaire is, of course, by no means a uh, definitive history of the nation, but it's nevertheless important to understand, to really grasp the nation's long and diverse history. While Kinshasa Stadium lies in ruins, and the country is plagued with yet another despot, a third place finish in the 2015 African Cup of Nations suggests that the African, uh, that African football in Zaire, at least, or Congo as it's now known, may still hold some purchase. Now, in a day where my shorts ripped in two in Dublin Airport, my Ryanair flight was delayed by two hours, and my train was delayed by an hour, it has nevertheless still been a pleasure to speak to all of you tonight. I'd like to thank you for coming out. I look forward to any comments, questions, and hopefully not too many criticisms that you might have. Thank you very much.